the £1.4 billion bonus, how Shell made more in profit than it expected. Much like its rival BP, the bumper results have led to calls for a higher windfall tax and complaints that prices are still high at the pumps. There's nothing wrong um, the companies to make a profit, but it has to be balanced. I think the government should really look into extra money that the companies or corporations like these are making. I mean, you drive down the road, you need to fill up again. Also this lunchtime, did a pregnancy test cause birth defects? The High Court hears from hundreds of women who believe their babies were harmed decades ago. It is such a big deal, such a huge deal, and not just for us. Remember, this is for people in the future who've been damaged, who won't have to go through this. A special report on the drug that's killing an American every eight minutes. And a royal cheers from the Prince and Princess of Wales at a pub preparing for the coronation celebrations. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. Shell has become the latest oil giant to make a much bigger profit than expected. In the first three months of the year, it made £1.4 billion more in profit than experts had predicted. Year on year, its earnings rose by 5.7%. Campaigners say the results, like BP's earlier this week, show a higher windfall tax is needed. Chloe Keedy has the details. Want to be one of Business just keeps getting better for Shell. Its global oil and gas empire is raking in record profits. But while shareholders and executives reap the rewards, its customers at the pump are feeling poorer. That we're all struggling and like big companies are profiting out of it. How can that be fair? They just charge what they want to charge and we have to pay what they want to pay. You do now factor in, should I take the bus or the underground or should you drive? Even if I'm running the company, I would have done the same, but it's up to the government to regulate. Shell recorded profits of over £7.5 billion in the first three months of this year, outperforming forecasts by nearly £1.5 billion. Earlier this week, its rival BP also announced earnings of £4 billion in the same period, exceeding expectations by more than £500 million. Despite a fall in oil prices in recent months, Shell said its profits had been boosted by a rise in sales of chemicals and products. But campaigners say this is just more proof that the government needs to take a tougher stance. Hi, well, this has just proven that even with the, the windfall tax that was introduced, these energy giants can well afford it. They could have even afforded to have been taxed even at a higher rate for the windfall tax. People will be aghast at what's happened and they'll be wanting to see the government take stronger action because these profits are made on the backs of people living in cold, damp homes. Shell has said it'll be returning just over £3 million to shareholders by buying back some of its shares over the next three months. Shell and BP are still pumping out vast quantities of cash and Shell's returned some of this to shareholders, which it would say it has a duty to do. However, over the longer term, there's an argument to say that with efforts to cut oil demand, in fact, what they should be doing is plowing more money into renewables. Shell insists it does pump profits back into green energy. But as its earnings continue to climb, many customers feel they're the ones paying the price. Chloe Keedy, ITV News. Women and children who claim to have suffered miscarriages and birth defects from a pregnancy test drug are giving evidence in the High Court today. Primados was offered to women from the 1950s until the late 1970s to test if they were pregnant. More than 170 people who say they've been harmed by the drug want compensation from the drug companies and the government. The defendants are arguing that the case should be dismissed. Andrew Misra has spent the morning at the High Court. Take us through what it's heard so far on this. 
Yeah, well, it's day three of this five-day hearing, and this morning, defence lawyers for those big pharmaceutical companies and the government finished presenting their evidence after repeatedly stating that these claims are speculative and bound to fail. The crux of their argument is that there's no causal link between these hormone pregnancy tests, or HPTs, including primados and birth defects, but more than 100 claimants strongly disagree with that, including Marie Lyon a campaigner whose daughter was born in 1970 without her lower left arm after Marie was prescribed Primados while she was pregnant. She told me earlier that she still feels a lot of guilt about taking those tablets all those years ago, but that she is confident that this case won't be thrown out and that it will go forward to a landmark full trial. It is such a big deal, such a huge deal, and not just for us. Remember, this is for... People in the future who've been damaged, who won't have to go through these 40 odd years of fighting, knockbacks, disappointment. You know, we've lost 36 members since these, these reports started. 36 of our families have lost someone who was fighting for justice for their child. So, how many are going to be left? Well, similar proceedings were dropped back in 1982, but at the end of this morning, the claimant's barrister, Charles Feeney, did start to present their case, which featured a lot of scientific literature and mainly is on the link between these limb reduction defects and the use of HPTs. The hearing is continuing this afternoon and will conclude on Tuesday, after which Mrs Justice Yip will make her final decision about whether this will go to a full trial. Andrew Misra, thank you. The Israeli army has killed three Palestinian men suspected of being involved in the deaths of a British-Israeli woman and her two children. Lucy Meyer and Rena D died when their car was attacked near their home in the West Bank. Last month, Israeli forces raided an apartment in the West Bank, killing three men. The army said that the two of them belonged to the militant Hamas group and described the other as a senior operative. Voters have been heading to the polls today in England's local elections and the rules have changed a little this year. And you'll now have to show ID if you're going to a polling station to vote. It has to be a form of photo identification, such as a passport, driving licence or a blue badge. Biometric resident permits, defence identity cards and national identity cards issued by the EU will also be accepted. And the over 60s and disabled people can use their bus or travel passes. Let's speak to our political correspondent, Libby Vina, who's at a polling station in Windsor. Libby, it's not just the coronation people there are getting excited about. Yes, well, I think they are quite excited here since we've been at this polling station. Turnout has been pretty brisk and nobody so far seems to have forgotten their ID. Now, these are very important elections, the first ones to be held in certain seats since 2019, uh, when Theresa May was Prime Minister. We're on our third Prime Minister since then, and the outcome of these elections could perhaps determine who gets the top job next. Uh, something like uh, 230 councils up for grabs and 8,000 seats. All the main parties will be poring over these results, uh, uh, paying close attention as to what they show, as to which way the political wind is blowing and whether they do need to raise their game and in which way ahead of a general election next year. Now, many uh, councils won't be counting uh, the, the votes until tomorrow, but I understand that here in Windsor they are planning to start counting overnight, so there should be some uh, indication of the results uh, first thing tomorrow morning. And if that isn't exciting enough for the people of Windsor, then the King will be back here for the coronation concert on Sunday. Libby Vina, thank you. Russia has accused Washington of masterminding an alleged drone attack on the Kremlin, which it claimed yesterday was carried out by Ukraine. The Kremlin had claimed it was an attempt to assassinate President Putin and today said it was facing an unprecedented wave of sabotage on its soil. I'm joined by our correspondent Lucy Watson. Lucy, this uh, whole episode is bizarre, but also potentially destabilising. 
It is, Nina, and this is just 24 hours after Russia claimed Ukraine had tried to assassinate President Putin with these two drone attacks on the Kremlin. They're now shifting the blame to the United States. In the last few hours at a press conference, they said the US was undoubtedly behind the alleged drone attack, but has yet to provide any evidence proving that. Now, images and video of these drones emerged yesterday. Now, I think we can have a look at them now. You see the red circle there. That is one drone heading towards the Senate Palace. You see it explode, then another one too, both detonating within 15 minutes of each other. Now, the Kremlin is a fortress, so seeing images of part of it on fire are extraordinary. Mm. Now, uh, Ukraine strongly denied any involvement yesterday. It believes Russia manufactured the whole thing to distract attention from a counteroffensive that is expected imminently by Ukraine, and also to justify an escalation in its own military action. Now, today, President Zelensky is not in Ukraine. He's made a surprise visit to, to The Hague, where he said that President Putin should face international war crimes court. Of course, we all want to see different Vladimir here <laughs> in The Hague, the one who deserves to be sentenced for these criminal actions right here in the capital of the international law. Now, it's worth saying, Nina, at this point, there's been no independent verification of these drone attacks. And, and truth, sadly, is an uh, inevitable casualty of war quite often. Mm. Lucy, thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, we'll be reporting from Australia, where the King spent time at a remote mountain school. And it's almost time to say farewell to the pandas at Edinburgh Zoo. But first, the drug fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than heroin, is now the leading cause, cause of overdose deaths in America. It was responsible for killing nearly 70,000 people in 2021. That's roughly one American every eight minutes. Good morning, Britain's North America correspondent Noel Phillips has the story from Los Angeles. We're being driven into the heart of America's drug epidemic. Out here, I never, I never went to jail. I, I could just openly use drugs there. Skid Row is a place where Hollywood actor Chris Browning spent years as an addict using heroin, cocaine and crystal meth. I was a full-on junkie. I would just go out and do what I had to do to get my money, to get my drugs, so I could come back here and spend the day and the night just being a heroin addict. On a nearby street, we meet Jennifer, who started using heroin at just seven years old. I'm scared to die because I'm scared I'll never be able to get high again. That's how much I depend on drugs. And that's terrible because I don't want to depend on drugs. I want to be able to depend on my wife. Despite battling stage four cancer, she recently overdosed on fentanyl. I've died like four or five times. It's really bad. Fentanyl is cheap but deadly and is easily available as this dealer showed us. Just a week ago, Candice lost two friends. She told us why she's risking her life just to get high. It take the pain away so I won't cry no more. We saw countless people openly using drugs, seemingly unaware of their surroundings. It looks like a refugee camp, you know? This is like some civil war ravaged, you know, country in the Middle East. It's just, and, and it's the United States of America. We're in Los Angeles, California. What is happening here is a genuine emergency, the likes of which this country has never seen. Noel Phillips reporting from the United States. The Prince and Princess of Wales have been getting into the spirit of the coronation celebrations and doing something many of us may do this weekend, enjoying a visit to a pub. Kate and William have been at the Dog and Duck in London's West End in Soho. Our correspondent Romley Weeks is there too. Romley, you could say a perfect day for a pub visit and a bit of a walkabout. Well, absolutely, Nina. The Prince and Princess of Wales probably aren't regulars on the streets of Soho or in the Dog and Duck, for that matter, but they've certainly been causing a bit of a stir here. You can probably see the crowd just starting to break up behind me and all the police, but the uh, Prince and Princess of Wales did a walkabout that lasted a good 
15 minutes in this crowd, shaking hands, taking selfies, chatting, looking incredibly relaxed. And before that, they were in the Dog and Duck pub, this iconic Soho pub on the corner here, pulling pints and having half a cider. William joked that uh, you never know who you're going to meet in a pub. I don't think anybody here expected that they would be meeting Kate and William on a Thursday lunchtime. Uh, Kate was talking about how Prince George has been rehearsing for his role in the coronation on Saturday when he's going to be page to the king. Quite a lot of responsibility on his nine-year-old shoulders. And all this pulling pints and chatting to the public, rather a contrast to the gilded splendor and the grandeur that we're going to see on Saturday. And if the palace is conscious of the impression that that gives off in the middle of a cost of living crisis, probably no bad thing to dispatch the most popular member members of the royal family to do just this and they didn't just do this walkabout they also arrived here on the london underground traveling on the elizabeth line named after the queen of course and opened by the queen in one of her last public appearances almost exactly a year ago uh, kate once said that uh, traveling on the tube was one of the things that she most missed about her pre-royal life but both kate and william doing their best to look absolutely in touch with the public today. Romilly Weeks, thank you very much. Thank you. And the journey the King has taken through his life has probably helped shape the monarch he is and the reign he will enjoy. Charles the ecologist, the campaigner and the adventurer. Our correspondent Dan Rivers reports from Australia where the then prince spent two terms at Timbertop in the mountains of southeastern Australia and where he was embraced by his fellow pupils. The prince will have the very best guide to show him around Timbertop. In 1966, the future king embarked on a remarkable adventure in Australia, spending six months at one of the world's most challenging schools. This footage captured the start of Charles's stay at Geelong Grammar's Timbertop campus, a rigorous experience in the mountains of Victoria. Has very definite ideas on keeping this tour moving. For decades, pupils have been put through their paces, hiking and developing self-sufficiency, a tradition which carries on to this day. Those who were there with the then Prince of Wales remember what a culture shock it must have been. My, how young he looks. He doesn't know what's about to hit him, poor fellow. Charles had to muck him with the others, even though he was effectively a prefect, but he showed leniency in the face of wanton rule-breaking. I was having a uh, cigarette in the boiler room one evening and uh, Charles sprung me. He walked in. He looked taken aback. Um, dismayed and said, Saudi, you should know better than that. And he confiscated the cigarette. And I fully expected uh, that Charles would report me to my master, but nothing happened. Uh, it humbles me to think of a memory where I've been spared in that manner by the King of England. Charles Armitage was another treetop contemporary who remembers during one arduous hike, some of the boys hitched a lift home, but not Charles. The truck driver stopped and waited till everyone got on and when he took off he looked back in the mirror and there was this lonely figure trudging up the hill, very tired, and the driver yelled out to the rest of us, he said, what's wrong with that bloke? We said, don't worry too much about him, he'll be okay. And that was the future King of England. Having to saw your own firewood might be a world away from King Charles's reality today but there is no doubt he loved his time at Timbertop, a true immersion into the very best Australia has to offer. The whole thing has gone off very well. Dan Rivers, ITV News. And you can watch the whole day of the coronation unfold here on ITV. We'll be bringing special coverage of this momentous moment starting at 8.30 on Saturday morning. 
Finally, this lunchtime from Blind Date to Love Island, you don't normally get 12 years on TV dating shows to find love. But that's how long two giant pandas have spent at Edinburgh Zoo, but without any signs of romance. Later this year, they'll head back home at the end of the zoo's contract with China. Our Scotland reporter, Louis Scott, is there and sent this. Well, we're outside Yang Guan's enclosure here at Edinburgh Zoo. He's had a little wander outside and then he's most likely going back in to get some bamboo. I heard that's what he likes to do for most of the day. But this exhibit is still attracting people from not just across the UK, but from all over the world to see the pandas. But after 12 years, preparations are well underway for these pandas to return to China at the end of the year. Well, joining me is Head of Animals, Darren McGarry. Darren, what's it been like looking after these pandas for almost 12 years now? Do you know, it's been amazing 12 years having the pandas here. From the day they arrived in Edinburgh, I remember circling in the aeroplane that had the pandas in, and there were thousands of people all around the airport and lining the route to the zoo. It's been an amazing time. We've had over 5 million of our visitors that have travelled from all over Europe to come here to see the pandas, and they've become an Edinburgh resident. Everybody um, loves to see the pandas at the zoo. What's been a highlight for you? You know, the highlight, there are so many highlights, is um, working with giant pandas. When I was a kid, I never imagined that I'd see a real life giant panda. Um, and also I'm a bit jealous. Yang Guan gets sent hundreds of Valentine cards. They get birthday cards, they get sent gifts. We've got woolly hats that are knitted in shapes of pandas. We've had so many things. And that just shows the support that people have had for the pandas here. These are popular pandas. And will there be the same fanfare for the return journey later this year? Um, there won't be as much as a big celebration because we um, obviously will be saying goodbye to them. They'll be really welcome back in China and I've been working really hard with my Chinese colleagues. Um, myself and Alice and the Keeper will be travelling back with them and the red carpet will be rolled out for Yang Guan and Tian Tian to go back to, um, back to their home in China. Thank you so much, Dad. And I think Yang Guan's just popped his head back in here. But a really emotional goodbye for the keepers here who have worked with them every single day and have enjoyed working alongside them for over a decade now. Louise Scott reporting there. That's it this lunchtime. Charlene's here with the evening news at 6.30 from me. Bye-bye.